like to begin by doing is asking you about your earliest memory. Let's think about your earliest memory and what features of that memory can you remember? Uh, how old were you when that event occurred? And I'm going to let you think about that now because we'll come back to it uh, later on. So what makes us human in psychological terms? Is it intelligence? Is it personality? Is it consciousness or language? Well, in my many years studying psychology, and I've covered most of these subjects in my time, I've come to the conclusion that what really sets us apart as human beings in terms of our psychology is memory. And obviously, memory is intertwined with these other human abilities. So memory and language work together. That's something I'm going to be mentioning uh, later on. So people love talking about their memories. Life is about memory. So in this talk, what I want to do is to illustrate some of the ways in which memory can benefit us, as well as sometimes letting us down. But the message is positive. Memory slips, memory gaps, are a necessary part of us functioning well as human beings. Well, there are obvious reasons we can think about why memory is important. We need to remember how to get from A to B, remembering people's names, how to drive a car. Think about the various relationships you have in your life. You are a mother or daughter or sister, brother, nephew, friend or enemy even. And think about the ways in which you deal with all of these different people. I bet you, you're, you behave very differently when you're with your mom than it, when you're with your friend or, or, or with, when you're with your enemy. And how do we know how to be appropriate in these different relationships? It's because we have memory. So memory guides us in these kinds of social uh, relationships and it has an element to it that is really fundamental to what it is to be human. So, okay, that's one thing, relationships, and we don't know how to deal with other people. But without a memory, more importantly, perhaps, we don't know who we are. Uh, without a memory, we have no sense of history, so we have no sense of the past. Without that, we cannot plan in the present, and without that, also, we cannot plan for the future. So without a, pa a, a memory, we have no past, no present, and no future. And one of the reasons that we know, excuse me, um, one of the reasons that we know that this is the case is uh, from studies of amnesic um, patients. And people with certain types of amnesia um, have a real problem if you ask them to plan for the future. So if I ask any of you in this room, what will you be doing this time next week? What will you be doing this time next year? You might not have a clear plan, but you'll be able to say, well, I'll probably be doing this or I would like to be doing that. So uh, memory, we, we know from amnesic patients that memory is essential, not just for the history bit, but for the future bit as well. So I want to talk a bit about memory gaps when memory goes wrong. So memory gaps can be annoying embarrassing and downright dangerous. So forgetting where you put your keys, uh, forgetting somebody's name, forgetting did you turn the gas off when you left the house uh, this morning, making mistakes about someone you see in a shop or an encounter on the street and you cannot for the life of you remember the context for where you know that person. I want to just ask, and I'm not going to ask for the lights up, but I'm guessing what the answer is. Has anybody in this room had the experience of going upstairs to fetch something, and then when you get to the top of the stairs, you don't remember what you went for? <laughs> okay, that, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? It would be easier to ask, has anybody not had the experience of going up the stairs and not remembering what you went for? 
so we've all had it and it's interesting because sometimes when I talk to groups of older adults this is one of the things we call it absent-mindedness and it's one of the things that older people are really care, uh, concerned about and it's important for me to to let them know that this is a problem that everybody has so how do you go about retrieving the memory then if you get to the top of the stairs and you don't remember well certainly what I do, I go back down the stairs, I go to the place I was where I origin originally had the thought, and more often than not, it comes back to me, oh yes, I went up the stairs to fetch my glasses. And what this tells us is that context is really important in memory. Having that contextual information about where you were when the thought originally occurred to you. How about the embarrassment of being introduced to someone and then the next time you meet them, they greet you warmly, they shake your hand and they say, hey, Katrina, it's great to see you again. And you know their face, but you cannot, for the life of you, put a name to that face. And that, you know, so that's a really embarrassing situation. Now, um, I, I, it's about, this is about deep processing. So uh, what we're not doing here is processing their information, their, their name information deeply enough in the first place. So how do you get around that? You focus on the face, you shake them by the hand and look them in the eye. And when they say, my name is Andy, you say, hey, Andy, it's great to meet you. And right, I'm processing that information. I might even associate that name information with Another Andy that I know. Okay, so I've got some kind of anchor to that name and, and to that face. Uh, one of Bill Clinton's key characteristics as a, a charismatic politician was that he never forgot somebody's name. And people thought this was just, that he was the bee's knees. They thought so much of him. Uh, he, he thought so much of them, and then consequently, they thought so much of him. So they thought, oh, Bill Qu Clinton uh, knows my name. Um, so, you know, you can get a long way um, by doing these uh, uh, little memory tricks, and it really enhances uh, your chances in relationships. So it's about consciously making an effort to process the information. Let's think about cues for memory. And one of the things that I'm interested in is thinking of slightly unconventional cues for memory. So what about if you experienced just now the smell of the perfume that your mother wore when you were a child? Let's say that wafts through the room. What's that going to do for you? Well, I predict it's going to get some long forgotten memories back. It's going to have the experience of transporting you. If the, the, that smell is a memory that means enough to you, then you will feel transported and it will unlock a seam of memories that might otherwise not be easily retrievable. And similarly, what about uh, the effect of music? Uh, on memory and retrieving memories. So a song that might mean a lot to you that you haven't heard for many years. If you hear that song now, you again might find this, you get the sense of being transported. So we're really interested in my lab and other labs in looking at these cues and thinking about how can we use slightly alternative cues fully to appreciate the extent of uh, human memory. What I want to talk about now is uh, super memory. Uh, so uh, memory slips can be annoying, embarrassing, dangerous, but would you want to remember everything? For sure, uh, at first pass, this seems attractive. Um, and for some people, very few, they do have genuine super memories. Now, this might be useful, for example, if you witness a crime and you're called uh, to give evidence in court. And the judge asks you, let's say it's a knife crime, you witness somebody being attacked with, with a knife. 
Uh, you'll be asked questions like, what was the perpetrator wearing, the guy holding the knife? What was the victim wearing? Uh, what was the weather like? Um, now, what we know about witnessing crime, being an eyewitness, is that people experience something that we call weapon focus. And what happens here is that in a traumatic situation, you're focusing on the weapon, so the stuff around the edges uh, gets very blurred. So you might not remember what somebody was wearing because your whole attention is on the knife. So despite the fact that you are telling the absolute truth, because your memory is a bit patchy, a bit sketchy, you don't have that much information, you're, you may be regarded as being less reliable. So, okay, there's a situation in which, yeah, it'd be brilliant to have um, a super memory. But might it not be really annoying to have a super memory? So why do we need to remember what we had for lunch on Thursday three weeks ago? Um, and there's actually a case of one woman who has a super memory who calls this kind of memory a curse. She says, it plays over and over in my mind. We don't need that level of, of memory. So that's why, you know, not remembering everything is not necessarily a bad thing. I want to mention the case of a science journalist called Joshua Four. And uh, he was a, a, a journalist, but he was uh, nothing special in terms of his memory abilities. And, uh, but... Joshua decided he was, he was really interested in memory, and he saw evidence of these uh, world memory champions, and he thought, I want to be one of these. And ultimately, he did get to be a, a, a memory champion in the USA. And the, what, what he said about it was that anyone can do this. So um, if you use the right skills, if you use the right techniques, then any of us could win the world memory champions. And one of the te techniques he used was something called memory palaces. So uh, let me explain memory palaces to you. Let's say you want to uh, remember a list of random objects. I'm going to read them out because I'm not very good. My own memory is, is not very good, which is why I study it. Uh, let's see. I'll give you a few, few objects. Cabbage, book, train, armadillo, pen, Monkey, telescope, dog. Okay, and we'll come back to that in five minutes and see how many of these objects uh, you remember. They're not related in any way, so how are you going to do it? Right, I suggest you use a memory palace. And what this is, is thinking about a place or a route that is familiar to you and, uh, and, and thinking about placing the objects along that route. So... Uh, let's say you're standing at your front door, so somewhere that's nice and familiar. Visualize it. So memory palaces are very much about visualization. Visualize the front door and then notice that there's a cabbage on your doorstep. Then you come into the hall and there's a book in your way on the floor. And as you go in the kitchen, there's a train on the kitchen table, and as you hang your coat up, lo and behold, there's an ar armadillo at the coat stand. So you get the picture. Uh, I know it sounds a bit silly, but try it. Try it, and you know, it's remarkable. And, and Joshua Four used it as one of his techniques to win the USA uh, Memory and Championships. Okay, so uh, memory palaces, I, you know, I think they're really neat little tool. The other thing that I would say is, uh, so often I get asked as a memory expert, uh, how do I remember where I put my keys? It's not uh, rocket science, routine. Always put your keys in the same place. And sometimes people are disappointed when I give them that answer because they're like, is that it? And the answer is, yes, it is it. Okay, so back to our earliest memories. And now I am going to need uh, the lights up, please. Because what I want to ask you, oh, it's nice to see everybody. <laughs> um, what I want to ask you is uh, to think about the age you were when you had your earliest memory. 
Okay, so w what we're seeing there is a very uh, reliable kind of picture that we get every time we ask people about their early memories. And it seems that most people don't have memories much from belo below the age of two or three. So why is this? Well, I think it's about language. It's, I think it's no coincidence that it's, now I'm not to say that the, it's not to say that your earlier, earlier memories are not real, but that's a separate conversation. But it's around the age of three that children are developing language skills where they start to be able to tell stories about their lives. So I think it's this kind of storytelling that helps lay down uh, the memories properly so that they become lifelong memories. So how accurate are these memories? Well, and that's a, a question I'm often asked, how accurate are they? We can't go back in time and we don't really know, but there's an extent to which a lot of the time it doesn't really matter whether your memories are true or not. It matters that they're important and useful for your life story. So we can get, but just I'm summarizing, too, we can get bogged down by worrying about memory gaps. They can be really frustrating and sometimes they can be dangerous, but let's think about the positives about memory. Memory gives us a history, even if it's not that accurate, and that's the most important thing about it. It helps us to plan our future. Second, there are strategies we can use. We can try memory palaces, uh, deep processing, routine. There are ways that we can expand um, our memories. And I believe that the, 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 the limits of human memory are, are much bigger than uh, we, think we, are, the, we think they are if we, if we make the effort. And third, as far as human memory is concerned, the glass is certainly half full. Um, uh, there's lots more uh, capacity there. Uh, if we think about music and smell and all these cues that we could use to enhance our memory, there's a lot more in there than is easily retrievable. And it's about finding those cues. So I'll finish then with a, uh, I'm going to paraphrase a quote uh, from um, Salman Rushdie. He, he writes very eloquently about memory and about the subjectivity um, of memory. And he says, memory is not reality, but your memory, your own personal memory is truer than anybody else's. Thank you very much. <laughs>